Well, greetings and welcome to The Dividing Line. Uh, we are back here in the regular studio, and uh, boy, it's uh, the next trip's coming up pretty quick. I'm wearing my World War II fighter aircraft shirt today. But, <clears throat> you know, uh, Rich got Chinaed uh, recently, and uh, that's when you you buy something online that looks, you know, they make it look just great, you know. This, um, this uh, pad right here, I got chinaed big time. Oh, did I get chinaed? I mean, the the video presenting this made it look like it was the coolest thing ever. And you get it, and it's a cheap piece of garbage. And there's a huge difference between what you saw and what you get. And I didn't even realize until uh, last week, honestly, I was looking at this thing. You know, because it at least has... worth nothing uh the vast majority of the words uh on this well not the vast majority uh, uh what oh they can't see it no they can't see it stop that um the uh vast majority of words on this are misspelled um so engineering e-n-g-i-n-n-e-e r-i-n-g -E -E <laughs> Uh, casualties, ca causalties. Yeah, it was, it's English. And um, so uh, Rich got chined, I got chined. And I don't know if I got chined on this shirt. It fits nicely. It's nice and cool. That's the important part. But I thought for sure when I ordered this thing that prominently on it was my favorite World War II fighter. And it's nowhere to be found on it once I got it. Um, now, it's not that there aren't good some good planes on it. Um, there's a P-51 down there. I won't bother pointing these things out, but there's P-51 down lower on the shirt. That, of course, became, was the best fighter we produced, propeller-driven fighter we produced in World War II. Uh, it actually has the Messerschmitt uh, 262, I mean, the uh, jet fighter that did see action, so it, it, it qualifies. Um... But, it, and it also has, I think, one of the most beautiful of the World War II fighters was the P-38 Lightning. I mean, that thing was just, and our top ace in the entire war with 42 confirmed kills uh, had all those on a P-38. So that was a, an amazing plane. I mean, when it first came out, it killed pilots right and left because it had, talk about rushing stuff into production. <laughs> um, it, it, you basically learned from how many people it killed. Uh, but the one that I wanted, that's nowhere on it, and I used to have one in here, I think it's now in my office, was, of course, the Vought F4U Corsair. The screaming death is what the Japanese called it. Because not only was it uh, an excellent air-to-air -air fighter, as Pappy Boyington demonstrated in the South Pacific, um, but it was also a tough, rugged plane that could be equipped with rocket uh, sleds and bombs, and and uh, the the Marines just depended on it for close air support, like on Iwo Jima. And when it would dive, it would make this screaming noise, and it was so accurate they called it screaming death. Uh, but it's a beautiful plane. It had the gull wings, you know the, the ones I'm talking about. Uh, and I thought for sure that was going to be on this shirt, but I got, I got chined. You noticed right off there wasn't a, there's no Corsairs. No, no, no Corsairs. I'm, I'm a little bit sad about that, but oh, well, that's, uh, that's life. I had, I made a model Corsair, uh, as a young person, uh, that was just uh, really, really cool. Wish, wish I still had that. Um, cause that was just, that was just a gorgeous plane. And it's just so sad that the vast majority of young people today have no earthly idea uh, what that war was about, uh, how in the world we won it in literally four years. Um, all they know about is, you know, drones and stuff like that. It's uh, it was a different world, different world. Anyway, so um, we need to finish up the response to Trent Horn. Uh, we have promised it and been working on it. 
Um, I am uh, really excited. Uh, I will. We should be able to get this done with a little time left at the end of the hour uh, to be able to talk about this. But I'm really excited, and I I'm gonna I need to write back and invite her on the program. Uh, but I I was just you know that I have a debate coming up on September 16th in Mannheim, Pennsylvania, uh, with Dr. Gregory Coles, who is the author of um, Single Gay Christian. And so he is, along with Preston Sprinkle, a part of the movement that um, is presenting the idea of homosexuality as an inalterable, um, definitional aspect of a person's being. And I guess, evidently, transgenderism as well, at least from what I'm seeing. And so one person that I wanted to reach out to uh, in my preparation, of course, was Rosaria Butterfield. And so I did, and she very graciously responded, despite the fact that I even included in my email a picture of my kitten, um, which she thought was great because she has she's a cat person too. So we're discovering who the cat people are and who the cat haters are. It's um it's a sad thing. Um and uh you know, blocking is going away on Twitter soon. That's gonna be I don't know. Um it's gonna be gonna be rough, but I was thinking about just, you know, everybody who starts doing the anti cat stuff, just use the block feature while we've got it. And uh, we'll see what we'll see what happens with uh, with Twitter uh, down the road. Anyway, uh, I got in touch with her, and lo and behold, I didn't know this, um, but uh, Summer already had her new book and had written an endorsement for it. Um, and she has a new book called uh, Five Lies that I is either out or is about to come out, and. Um, so I was able to get hold of the review file on that. And um, obviously, inc it incredibly relevant to the subject of my debate on uh, in September. So I, I need to get hold of her and see if we can have her on to talk prior to um, prior to that debate. I think it'll be very, very, very helpful. And it is interesting. Uh, as I've gotten, I've, as I've been digging into it, um, the the impact of one's theology is very, very clear. Uh, very, very clear. We'll we'll talk more about that um, a little bit later on. But, anyways, back to Trent Horn. We need to get this done before I start talking about other things. Uh, I don't. I don't know if I had. Played this part or skipped it, but we're going to start with it, and we'll we'll press on from there. I'll, I'll I'll try to be I'll try to be short. Even if the word should not be translated in the active sense like God breathing, White and other Protestant apologists assume that the word connotes a unique authority to Scripture alone. But I've showed that this is not how the word was used in the early church. Here's how I framed their argument. Okay, and I did play that. Um, and again, there is no such thing as used in the early church, as if there is some kind of encyclopedic way of being able to say, well, this is, this is how this person used it, and this is how this person used it. Um, there, again, the material we have from the early church is extremely fragmentary. And so to try to pretend that there was a early church meaning, what's going to be funny here is that uh, Trent's going to preemptively try to uh, answer one of the more obvious objections to his new theory, his utilization of the vivification translation of Theodosius. Um, he's going to try to answer the reality that Rome has never rendered it that way. Uh, because that's, that would seem to be a rather obvious um, objection that the Roman Catholic Church has never come out and said, this is the proper way of translating this word. That's why it's not relevant to uh, Sola Scriptura, et cetera, et cetera. They just haven't done anything like that. So to 
to say, well, I've proven this. The best you can say is I've asserted this or I've, I've quoted McDonald and the reality is that there was a wide um, utilization of the term, but I have completely failed to even try to demonstrate that that's contextually Paul's usage. And I have so far kept completely mum about the fact that the man who's actually promoting the vivification translation doesn't believe Paul wrote it in the first place. <laughs> Just, you know, uh, that's why I said this was spin, spin damage control, um, because it's not, it's not actually dealing with the, um, with the reality uh, at, 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 at that point. Uh, so. But to continue. Okay, I, that's where I skipped something there. That, that's where I missed something. This was where I had, when, when he made reference, sorry, when he made reference to, that's where I was supposed to play it. I'll just do this quickly. He made reference to an ontological uniqueness to Scripture, and I said, that, that's me. That's, that's what I've always been teaching. Is no, nope, I was talking about Gavin Ortland, not talking about you, and he sort of got this little grin on his face there that he has there. Well, that's nice, uh, but, you know, and I don't, I don't care whether uh, Trent has actually read my book on Scripture alone or anything like that, uh, but the fact of the matter is, and I, Rich is busy with something else, so I'll read it from the book because I can't bring it up while that's up. Um, I had said this uh, a long time ago, uh, it, it doesn't matter. I've I've got it here now. Um, the nice thing is I had this book in accordance. That's why I was I was going to pull that up. But uh, I mentioned uh, da, 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 da. The, the title of this work of scripture alone, just the phrase faith alone, sola fide, the great cry of the Reformation, though no longer the great cry of many who were once considered children of the Reformation, is often misrepresented. So too, so too scripture alone could be misunderstood. When we say that faith alone brings justification, we're not saying that faith should be considered in a vacuum separated from everything else God does in the work of salvation. Instead, sola fide means that faith, apart from any concept of merit or works, actually in opposition thereto, is the sole means of justification. In the same way, scripture alone does not mean that God zoomed by planet Earth, dropped off the scriptures, and left us on our own. As we will note when we define sola scriptura, this is not a claim, for instance, that there is no church or that there is no spirit. The title does not suggest that Scripture, apart from the Spirit outside the church, is God's only means of leading his people. It is, however, saying that the Scripture is utterly unique in its nature. That's the exact same assertion. And this from 2000, was 2004, so almost 20 years ago. Um, it is, however, saying that Scripture is utterly, utterly unique in its nature as God-breathed revelation Nothing else is God-breathed. It is unparalleled and absolute in its authority. It is the sole infallible rule of faith of the church. It is both a positive statement, asserting the supremacy and uniqueness of the word, and a negative one, denying the existence of any other rule of authority on the same level. One would be dreadfully misunderstanding this book's title to think it supports the idea of a Christian absenting himself from the body of Christ, rejecting biblical teaching about elders and leaders, and perpetually sitting under a tree somewhere alone with the Bible. While an individual believer may derive great benefit from solitary contemplation of God's truth in such a context, it will always lead one back to service to his or her fellow believers in the church and to ministry within the context of being salt and light in the world. So uh, it was my assertion many, many years ago, decades ago, um, that Scripture is ontologically unique. And we need to keep in mind that to Trent Horn is saying, no, it's not. Uh, unlike all of his predecessors in all the debates we've done on the subject, he is saying, no, it's not. And then he'll say, yes, it is, but on a different level or something, as we'll get into here. Um, so, so there you go. Uh, back to right here. But to continue, one other argument White raises is that if Theopneustos has an active meaning of God breathing, and so it refers to Scripture giving divine life to readers— rather than being breathed out by God, then why doesn't the church say this? By the way, um, he's, he's conflating the idea of an active translation, uh, God breathing as in 
an ongoing process, which would make no sense whatsoever in Paul's usage of it, but, which doesn't matter to Poirier and many other people because Paul didn't write it anyways, um, but wouldn't make any sense in Paul's utilization of it uh, because of the context of his exhortation to Timothy. It is a known body that he is being referred to, uh, not, um, you know, there's going to be, Timothy, is there's going to be more coming down the road. So, you know, uh, you're going to have uh, what the popes are going to say and, and the successors of Peter and uh, none of this kind of stuff is even slightly in, in the context of second Timothy chapter three. Um, but, He's conflating two things because you can have a vivification idea, uh, giving life, uh, without even using the term God breathed. Um, so it's almost like he he's trying to sort of connect part of it with another part, which isn't really what's being done, even in the literature that he's citing. It's it's a little confusing. Uh, as to exactly where that's coming from. And this, again, all this goes back to, do we start with meaningful methodologies of exegesis, or do we start with external traditions that then determine the methodologies we use to come up with whatever meaning we need to come up with out of the text? That, that is very problematic. Isn't it the magisterian's job to determine what the Bible means? Others have said in comments to my previous episode that Theopneustos means inspired in a unique sense for Scripture, because that's how the Church uses the word in its biblical translations or magisterial documents. First, the Church rarely officially defines what a word in Scripture means. It officially teaches doctrine, but it rarely says this word in Scripture means X. It does that for Presbyteroi in James 5 to say this refers to priests, and not merely to elders in the community, for example, but it doesn't officially define many of the words that are used in biblical translations. Scholars have freedom to figure that out. Now, this is fascinating. I, I would like to know the specific reference that he has in mind in regards to Presbyterian, because um, certainly that was part of what Mitch Paco and I discussed when we debated the priesthood, but the reality is that's Rome's error. That's, that's, um, if there has been some infallible definition of that term, they're just wrong. And I would like to know where this infallible error is because I'll add it to the other areas where Rome is infallibly wrong about a lot of things. But, uh, again, if you derive the meaning of presbyteroi from its uses in the New Testament, and if you allow the New Testament to stand as a unit and not chop it up into pieces and say, well, this wasn't written by an apostle and that wasn't written by an apostle and so on and so forth. Um, the meaning of presbyteroi is clear and it's not, it's not priest. It doesn't mean priest. There's a perfectly good term for priest in the Greek New Testament. Um, and it is not used. There, there, there are no qualifications for priests in the New Testament, um, but there are for bishops, elders, uh, teachers, pastors, because they are used interchangeably with one another uh, in the two offices, the um, the elders and the deacons. And so uh, I'd like to know where that specifically is. But again, the, the question that all the rest of us want have is, wait a minute, um, we're told that the only way to read scripture is within the uh, bosom of the church. Uh, that scripture is simply the written tradition joined together with the oral tradition to make sacred tradition. Um, we're told that Rome defines doctrine and dogma. How do you define dogma without defining the words in which it was revealed? How do you do that? I don't, I don't even begin to understand, uh, you know, we, we keep being told, you need the church for these things. And then we go, okay, show us. Well, you know, the church doesn't normally do that. <laughs> you know, it's the have, have your cake and eat it too type of, type of thing. It's, it's got to be one or the other. 
And if you're going to say, well, you need to have the church to define these things. Well, first of all, you're not letting the church define these things. You're letting a non-Catholic scholar from last year define these things. Uh, that's highly problematic. But at the same time, you all are the ones making the claims that Rome has this ultimate authority. And if it, it, it is true that for example, in the last dogmatic definition of the bodily assumption of Mary, there was all sorts of covering your trail, covering your ankles. Um, basically, you know, did Mary die? Did Mary not die? Well, we don't know. Well, there is lots of discussion of Mary's death in the early church. And so we're not really, you can't even know what it means. How, how is it even relevant? Um, it, it's, it's truly amazing when you really start pushing for consistency. Um, it all just comes back to, well, just believe what we tell you to believe. Don't worry about where we got it from or anything else. Just, just believe what we, we tell you to believe. Uh, so really what we're going to see here in this uh, interesting attempt to say, well, yeah, you know, we haven't, Rome hasn't defined these, these words. What that means is you don't have an infallible definition, so you can't argue anything. You can, all you can say is, well, we don't know. My ultimate authority won't tell me. Um, and you have to go, well, does that mean you don't have an apostolic tradition? Accurately understanding what this means? Because you got to understand, the scripture was revealed in a world that did not have what we would call secularism in it. So this is now a vitally important question. This is a vitally important subject. What is the nature of scripture? And so how, how does Rome deal with that? We deal with that by plumbing the depths of scripture and making application of Christian worldview to any kind of even highly perverted perspective, such as secularism, that can arise in God's world and hold men accountable to that. But when you have this super secret oral tradition that you never have to, you never have to go, here's where it is. We're going to put our cards on the table. Here's the entire content of oral traditions. Never been done, never will be done. Can't be done. That's, that is obvious beyond question that there is no oral tradition that has been passed down separately from Scripture. But that's fundamental to the Roman Catholic position. Um, can't possibly avoid it. And the irony is, um, Rome has told us in the past. Remember Sixtus's infallible Vulgate? Remember when a pope said, here is the final edition, use this. And... He dies, and within a few years, they're collecting them all up and hiding them because it was so badly done. Remember when Rome, remember when you could die a gruesome death at the stake um, for promoting the Greek over the Latin? Remember that? Wasn't all that long ago. So, now Rome has changed. Rome recognizes the primacy of the biblical languages and the secondary nature of Latin, but that wasn't the case at the Reformation and for a long period of time after the Reformation. So if you're defining the Vulgate as the final word, are you not defining meanings of words uh, thereby? If, if, if Sixta said, this is it, then... This is what the text is supposed to be. This is, this is the final word. It's not the final word anymore. How could you have known that the day after Sixtus uh, put out his version as the infallible vicar of Christ? Well, because no one outside of Rome believed he was the infallible vicar of Christ at the time. So that's why you have to be all anachronistic and read stuff backwards and do things like that. Um, but how would you have known? I guess in the same way that you would have known Honorius was wrong about monothelitism? No, you had no way of knowing. 
um, that's that's the problem with this kind of this kind of stuff. It's um, yeah. So we uh, we we press forward. Second, the meaning of theological terms changes over time. The church currently uses theopneustos in a narrow sense, like translating it inspired or saying it only properly applies to scripture. Now, did he just say that theonustos only applies to scripture? But that that's just today? Is that an admission that the modern Roman understanding is not apostolic it goes against the apostolic church the early church he's gonna try to argue this is some kind of evolution but he doesn't give us any evidence as to why we should believe that i mean where does the church say well you know we've known about the vivification understanding um but we've developed a more narrow meaning of inspired the problem is, inspired is a Latin term, which I can understand why Rome likes Latin terms. But as such, it is not um, nearly exhaustive of the depth of Theonustos itself, because you can you can you can have inspired mean. Um, uh, breathing into something. And that's not what is being, that's not, this is, again, if you allow the New Testament to be the New Testament. And again, see, someone like Poirier is not going to believe this because he's not going to believe that Peter wrote that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own will own interpretation, own activity, epiluseos. Um, so if you let the New Testament speak for itself as a body of revelation, then that meaning would not follow because it's not just human words that are being breathed into by the Spirit of God. That's not Peter's description. He said men spoke from God as they were being carried along by the Holy Spirit. Not that their words are the first thing, and then there is a breathing into them that makes them special. It's God speaking that is first, comes through those men as they're carried along by the Holy Spirit. Can Peter's description be relevant to the meaning of Paul? Not in modern progressivism. Not in modern progressivism, which is, again, the question that it, progressivism never produces apologetics. There's nothing for it to defend. There's nothing for it to, um, it has no interest in engaging in a defense of the faith because that assumes an objectivity, a historical reality that progressivism just doesn't even believe in. So where, where's, where's all that gonna, gonna come from? I, I, I don't know. I don't know, but I stopped it before I needed to. Dave Verbum speaks of the apostolic preaching, which is expressed in a special way in the inspired books, was to be preserved by an unending succession of preachers until the end of time. Sacred scripture contains the inspired word of God in a particular written form. Sacred tradition contains the Word of God in an unwritten form that the Church lives out in its practice of the faith. So it's not inspired like Scripture, because... So there's something unique about the nature of Scripture. Now, where this definition of oral tradition comes from, certain doesn't come from the Apostles. It doesn't come from the early Church. You have to look over, you have to ignore... Um, Augustine and Athanasius and, and all these other statements about the sufficiency of Scripture and stuff like that. You have to ignore all that. So again, we're, we're engaging in the, ne the necessary, from the Roman Catholic perspective, anachronistic reading of early church. But still, you have the assertion here, it sounds like that there's still something about inspiration 
that's unique to Scripture. But if oral tradition is apostolic and is meant to and has somehow been preserved without any historical record and against the witness of historical record for 2,000 years. I mean, again, what was the last dogma defined on the basis of oral tradition? Bodily assumption. Unknown in the early church. And that's not just an argument from silence. Gavin Ortland put out an, uh, a video just last week. Um, and I guess he had been working on it prior to Trent Horn's video where he identified arguments against bodily assumption as arguments from silence. Well, they're not just arguments from silence at all. At all. It's not just, well, you know, no one ever mentioned it. Well, that's just an argument from silence. There were so many different theories and speculations later on. And the point is that if you're going to say something was delivered by the apostles to the church, it is incumbent upon you to demonstrate that, to give some stinking basis from the writings of the early church. Unless you can sit there and go, well, you know, like you said, they're fragmentary, so there were, a lot, there were lots of references to our dogmas, but they were all in the part that got lost. <laughs> uh, okay, if, if that's the best you got. Uh, when you're when you're making up fantasies, um, you know, that's the best that's the best you've got. Um, so anyway, uh, there is a um, oh wait a minute I I'm supposed to play through the the, the text has begotten it's very small for me today uh, for another minute here so we 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 press forward. Second, the meaning of theological terms changes over time. The church currently uses theopneustos in a narrow sense, like translating it inspired or saying it only properly applies to Scripture. Dave Verbum speaks of that's, that's start all over again. the oh, apostolic well. preaching, which is expressed in a special way in the inspired books, was to be preserved by an unending succession of preachers until the end of time. Sacred Scripture contains the inspired Word of God in a particular written form. Sacred tradition contains the Word of God in an unwritten form that the Church lives out in its practice of the faith. So it's not inspired like Scripture, because it's an unwritten form. But that doesn't mean sacred tradition is not as authoritative as Scripture, or that the magisterium is not infallible. The teachings of the Council of Jerusalem were just as binding on Christians in the first century when they existed in an unwritten form before they were written down in Scripture years later. Okay, so let's just point that out. He's talking about, of course, Acts 15, which is during the apostolic period. So Revelation continues. Okay, that, that, that is not relevant to a period after the last of the apostles died, because we all agree that Revelation ceased at that, at that point. And so the quote-unquote Council of Jerusalem, Acts chapter 15, um, is part of that apostolic period, and there's still divine revelation that was being given through the apostles at that particular point in time. The issue is, was there a body of oral traditions delivered outside of Scripture? This is normally when you'd find people going to 2 Thessalonians 2.15. I had a guy on Twitter go there today, and I used our new transcript function. <laughs> I, I better be using it, because I can guarantee you my enemies are using it. Um... I used our transcript function to pull up uh, a number of different places over the years where we have walked through 2 Thessalonians 2.15 and demonstrated uh, that what is being referred to there is not some separate body of oral tradition, but it is simply the gospel which has been delivered to the Thessalonians in written form and in oral form. That is, orally, when Paul was in Thessalonica, and in written form in what's called 1 Thessalonians. That's all it's referring to. And if Rome is going to try to use that text to say, ah, there's a, then it is incumbent upon them to demonstrate the existence of this tradition and the content of this tradition uh, from the first century. I mean, because it was delivered to the Thessalonians, not just to the bishop 
or bishops or elders in the church in Thessalonica, because that's not who it's addressed to. It was delivered to all the Thessalonians. So you could tell me the Thessalonians knew about everything that's in oral tradition? When did the bodily assumption of Mary enter into that? Was Mary already dead at that point? Who knows? But it's it's all just pure speculation, or when it comes to Rome, pure assertion without evidence um, is what you're really talking about in this in this type of a context. So, all right, uh, we're getting close to the end here. Now, um, this is you. This is what you've you've got to give Trent um, props because he's thought this through. And he's got to come up with an example. It, it can't be drive from the early church because there's nothing there for them to drive from as far as you know, oral tradition and stuff like that. So how do you explain that Theonoustos was understood this way in the early church, but we've, we've come up in 2023 We've come up with the proper understanding without having actually asked the Pope about it. Because I get, I'm sorry, that I, I'm not really sure what you'd come up with if you asked Francis about anything like this. Um, and I think most Roman Catholic apologists would be very fearful of asking Pope Francis about any of this as well. But, um, and, and, and no matter what response he gave, would it matter? Who is he to judge? Right? That's what he said on homosexuality a long time ago. Who, who am I to judge? Um, so what would happen then? I don't know. But my point is that the way the church uses the word now does not mean that was how the word was used in the first few centuries of church history. Hebrews 1.3, for example, says Christ is the exact representation of God's nature or substance. In Greek, apostasies. But by the 4th century, the word apostasis was no longer the common Greek word for nature or substance. It had been replaced with the word ousia, all right? So that was the word that meant substance. So theologians in the 4th century said the Trinity was three apostases, persons, that share one ousia, substance. If you read this 4th century understanding of apostases back into Hebrews 1.3, it would say that Christ is the exact representation of God's person, the person of the Father, which could lead to the heresy that the Son and the Father are the same person, or modalism. Now, other words like sacrament or mysterion in Greek, heresy, dogma, these words have changed meaning over time. So we can't read the modern definition of those terms back into their uses in Scripture and ancient documents. So, fascinating. Uh Give the man, give the man props. Um, here's the problem. Uh, there is no question that in the Christological controversies, specifically after the Council of Nicaea, uh, one of the one of the real issues that was struggled with was how to understand terms related to the nature and being of God and what terminology to use to refer to the divine persons. And Nicaea was resisted initially in the East by some anyways, because in the East they, they had already struggled with modalism, dynamic monarchianism, uh, what we would call today Jesus-onlyism, UPCI stuff, obviously all sorts of different theories, but they had already rejected that stuff. And using homoousius uh, sounded to them like what their opponents from the preceding century were saying. Or at least it could be understood in that way. Then the other thing you've got going on is you have the confusion of the primary language in the East being Greek and the primary language in the West being Latin. And so how to render 
those terms and make them understandable across the linguistic divide, to be honest with you, was never fully accomplished. And in fact, I would say that some of the um, tension and problems all the way to Chalcedon uh, can be traced to that, to, to suspicions, let's put it this way, suspicions in the East as to what the people from the West were meaning with Latin and vice versa. Uh, it didn't help. So there is no question that hypostasis is used in Scripture. And by the time they're trying to hammer out what terms to use, 400 years later, it has been decided to distinguish, to make a... Uh, we've got to be careful with that term, distinguish, don't we? Um, we distinguish. Uh, to, to make a distinction that is not biblical. Now, part of that is just simply... You're seeking to answer questions that are not necessarily um, being asked by the apostles. Uh, but there is a, it's very important to recognize that there has been a development at that point and that the biblical meaning of hypostasis and the related terms is different than the developed meaning later on. But again, while that is a true observation, what does that have to do with taking a one-off progressivist, non-Roman Catholic 2022 speculative definition of Theonustos and reading it back into the text? Because what we're saying is, in its context, and that context includes Pauline authorship, it's apostolic, it came from the apostles, not from a group of followers at a later point in time, um, that the apostolic meaning in 2 Timothy 3.16 speaks to the nature of Scripture and its ability to thoroughly equip the man of God in the church to communicate the truth of God to the people in the church, to exhort them, to correct them, to train them, and that there is nothing like that that is presented to Timothy. So just as in Acts 20, I commit you to God and the word of his grace, in 2 Timothy 3, 6, and this is in light of heresies, this is in light of the falsehoods that are coming that Paul's warning about. And he says to Timothy, Timothy, you remain convinced of that which you've known from youth, those scriptures which are able to make you wise unto salvation. And why are they able to do this? Because they are God-breathed. Not because they give life. They do give life. That is not an untrue Definition is just extremely partial and insufficient in the context that Paul uses. Once you dismiss that, you can make it mean whatever you want it to mean, which is what progressivists do. So there's two different contexts here. I, I when I heard this, I was I was like, kudos to Trent. This is as good a cover as you're going to come up with until someone comes along and says, yeah, but that's not actually what's going on here. And in reality, he would have to be arguing that his definition, uh, he's actually arguing that the traditional definition is the uh, evolved definition, but that he's found the immediately post-apostolic forgery definition, maybe? Um, and that what that means is he can continue to allow Rome to use inspired, 
and to use the language it's always used, but then turn this new thing upon us because you don't, you can't have that evolution thing, you see. We can have that evolution under the authority of the magisterium, but you can't do that. And so we'll hold you accountable for what we're saying now is the meaning in the early church that we don't have any official word on, but we're going to argue it from McDonald and Poirier, even though they're actually sort of arguing different things. But anyway, well done, um, but it doesn't actually fly, um, unfortunately. Almost there. Uh, three little ones left to go. Just because the church recognizes Scripture is unique because it's inspired does not prove 2 Timothy 3.16 is saying that about Scripture. So the church recognizes that Scripture is unique because it's inspired, but that's not what somebody else said to Timothy. Or it wasn't to Timothy, because Timothy wouldn't have been around either. But some forger made it look like Paul said something to Timothy. Um, so evidently, the unique... So now, so now the idea is the, the uniqueness that you can find in Roman Catholic statements and doctrines... Uh, uh, documents, sorry, uh, that, can, that teach doctrines... Uh, that th that's the evolutionary understanding, but that the original understanding is this vivification, broader scripture isn't unique. Because he's arguing against, he's arguing that in the early church, they didn't believe scripture was unique. That's what he's arguing. Now, I think that's absurd, but he's arguing on the basis of, well, they would refer to things, they didn't use as specific terminology as we're using later on. Okay. Which is why the early church should be corrected by Scripture, which is why the medieval church should be corrected by Scripture, which is why the modern church should be corrected by Scripture. Uh, but you don't have any ability to correct anything by Scripture once you're a Roman Catholic. You can't correct anything by Scripture because Scripture is subject to higher authorities and to higher... Um, powers of interpretation, I guess we should say. Um, so, so again, the, the question is, so Scripture is unique, but only because Rome says that it is now, but Rome doesn't say that it is in the way we're arguing it is, so that's how you get rid of Sola Scriptura, I think. We also need to study how the word Theopneustos was used in the ancient church and in the, the ancient context in which these documents were written to find out what it meant in that context. So we have to do a word study. That's what I did in the previous episode, drawing on McDonald and Poirier's scholarship. And it's something White just does not do in his reply to me to show what that his meaning of the word is correct. He simply doesn't do that. So we have done that. I've pointed out that my whole focus was something else, but we've done that now. We've provided the contextual from the New Testament. You don't define this term by going 150 years later and go, look at how somebody used it over here. So what? How did Paul use it? And what was the context within that, uh, within that context? People doing odd things to... We're all fine here now. Yeah, okay. I wondered where Rich was running off to. I'm sitting here trying to do a program, and he's running off to some other place. I'm like, what's, what's going on here? Is the volume up for this next clip or what? I don't know. We'll find out as we're going along. Um, so a lot of people are getting lost by about now. But the key thing that keeps all of this somewhat silly, to be honest with you, is that on the one hand, what we're being told is, well, Scripture is unique because it's inspired because Rome says so. But the early church didn't have that clear a definition. And so we're willing to utilize scholarship that actually removes the use of Theodostos from being Pauline. So you don't have to worry about whether Paul wrote this or not. 
but we will give you that definition from outside of the New Testament, from fragmentary documents, but we will not actually worry about whether Paul wrote it or not. Because it, it's, it's clear to me that modern Roman Catholic scholarship is quite amenable to progressivist understandings of the authorship of the Gospels. Uh, and I've pointed out the irony of this in the past, that one of the big arguments that Roman Catholics used for years and years was, well, how do you know Matthew wrote Matthew? And the reality is Rome doesn't know that Matthew wrote Matthew. <laughs> so, so every time they've used that argument, it's been a, it's been a bogus uh, argument uh, all the way along. Um, okay. Uh, just two more real, real quick here. Says it's the only infallible rule of faith. And Protestant arguments that try to show this often engage in circular reasoning, like saying Scripture is the only infallible rule of faith because there's nothing beyond Scripture that has the same level of authority. That's saying the same thing twice. Scripture is the only infallible rule of faith, and no evidence is presented to prove that. It's a circular argument. And here's White's response. And when he talks about circularity, let's remember something. When it comes to a discussion of ultimate authorities, they have to be circular. They have to be circular. Because you see, an ultimate authority cannot appeal to an authority above it to verify its authority because then that no longer the ultimate authority. Scripture never says it's the only infallible rule of faith. Of course, it never says anything about popes, cardinals, or Rome as the head of the church, papal infallibility. Uh, but it does tell us that Scripture is unique and beyond any use of the term tradition. So keep your eye on the ball. Always keep your eye on the ball when listening to Trent Horn and Catholic Answers and talking about Sola Scriptura because they will use one set of standards for Sola Scriptura and another set of standards for the infallibility of the church. I do use two different standards. I use the correct standard of Scripture, tradition, and the teaching authority of Christ's church to determine doctrine, and I judge your system, James, by your standard, Sola Scriptura. If you demand that the papacy and other doctrines be found explicitly in Scripture, Sola Scriptura must be found there as well. And okay, so one of the things that's fascinating, I, um, I was never able to track it back down. A couple of years ago, I was driving around. I happened to tune in um, to Catholic radio, terrestrial radio. Um, while I was driving around, I was over in Scottsdale, I recall. And... Catholic Answers was on. They were taking phone calls. They had an atheist call in. And I had really wanted to track that program down to, to play parts of it to illustrate the reality that Rome's apologetic methodology is very much wedded to the same form of synergistic um, honoring of the autonomy of mankind. And a lot of that goes back to the concept of reason and to the horrible anthropology that Thomas Aquinas had. Um, in contrast to a presuppositional response to the same atheist. So what I do is I wanted to play what had been said, and it might have been Trent, it might have been somebody else, but... Um, this issue of epistemology and what ultimate authorities look like is vitally important. And the uh, pontificate of Francis demonstrates that since he is the definition of apostolic succession and apostolic authority, that's the last point we're going to look at, um, then the fact that he is so fundamentally different in the entirety of his theology and worldview than that which gave birth to the papal syllabus of errors. Go read the papal syllabus of errors, okay? Here is what Rome said were errors not very long ago, recently in church history. What was it, 1850s? I don't remember the exact date. I'd have to look it up. I don't have it in front of me. 
Um, but as far as church history is concerned, that's yesterday. Read the papal syllabus of errors. Compare it with where Francis is. And the result is you do not have a consistent, unchanging, objective foundation for Roman Catholic epistemology. You just don't. And Rome always is reaching out to natural law arguments. Um, again, Thomas deeply infected that system with unbiblical thinking on key issues. And the result of that is, is seen in how things have changed. And the question I have is, how much are, more will things be changing? You already have a lot of Roman Catholics who are red-pilled. You know, they've woken up. How many more Francis's will it take before you can't avoid finally swallowing that red pill? That's really the question. Uh, and this all goes back to, hey, with if Scripture is not unique as God speaking, as seems to be his argument, by its own nature, um, then you have nothing that's going to be unchanging in the future. And the Roman Catholicism of 100 years from now is going to be so, so, so very different. Last one here. Let's uh, get to it quick. Now, I offered to actually defend apostolic succession. Okay, this is where he's talking about the upcoming debates uh, in February, where we're doing Sol Scriptura and Purgatory. And he's saying, well, hey, I offered to do this. Um, and here's what he says. You know, to def positively defend an authority claim, uh, in counter to him def positively defending an authority claim. But White said he didn't like the topic of apostolic succession, uh, which is interesting because Gavin Ortland has no problem with that topic. He's debated it before. He said he'd be happy to debate me on it. So we'll see. But we're in talks, hopefully sometime in February. We will do a double header debate. One night we will do, is Sola Scriptura true? The next night we'll do something like, is purgatory? The doc Right. So what about the apostolic uh, succession thing? You've got to have a meaningful definition to be able to debate. And in orthodox historic Roman Catholicism, the very embodiment and definition of apostolic succession is found in the papacy. Now, some might say, well, it's just in, in the bishops as a whole. But who is, how do you identify with what's going on in Germany right now, with the schism in Germany? Who defines who the bishops are? When the Council of Constance healed the papal schism, and then immediately thereafter the papacy crushed conciliarism, any meaningful definition for apostolic succession was ended. It was, it was ended. It becomes a... If, if you won't defend Francis, then you're trying to defend a far more nebulous concept that no one will ever be able to identify. That's just all there is to it. Um, and there's been no interest in defending Francis by anybody. Like I said, we had a debate set up for 2019 in Australia with Tim Staples. And he said no. He, he backed out of it. So, look, I fully understand. I wouldn't want to defend Francis either. But it's where you are. It's what you have committed yourself to. Uh, and it's um, highly, highly problematic. So we can bring that down. Uh, <clears throat> hopefully that was helpful to you. Uh, spent a fair amount of time on it. Real quickly, because uh, we're actually are out of time, but um, I just wanted to read you just to, as I said earlier in the program, I am reading uh, Rosaria Butterfield's uh, Five Lies of Our Anti-Christian Five Lies of Our Anti-Christian Age. Is that what it is? I, I can't see it on the page right here, but anyway. Um, 
Let me just read you just a, a section from the introduction, and you'll see why I'd like to try to get her on. Um, when the evangelical church embraced LGBTQ plus vocabulary, and it has, the true gospel was exchanged for a false one. Ironically, this made the world much less safe for people who experience homosexual desires or gender confusion than it ever was before. A genuine Christian who experiences the indwelling sin of homosexual desire or transgenderism will find both the world that says, do what feels good, and a church that says, you are a sexual minority and need a voice and platform in the church as equally dangerous. Where is it safe to just repent of sin and be built up in the promises of God? Where is it safe to repent and flee from your sin and no longer be gay or trans? Gay Christians tell you that they must navigate their homosexuality, but God equips you to overcome your sin. Why did it become wise for Christians to come out of the closet about their sin, to tell the whole world about their sin instead of repenting of it and seeking accountability from a pastor or elders and a few close friends? Coming out of the closet and describing yourself by sin will never help you to repent from it, flee from it, and be delivered from it. Coming out of the closet is a political act of celebration pride, and solidarity with a cause that shares no substance with Jesus Christ. The idea that you should always come out and share with everyone your sinful desires happened because homosexual desire was transformed from sin, which demands repentance, to a morally neutral category of personhood, LGBTQ+, which demands affirmation and celebration. There it is. If you want to know what the debate's going to be about, there it is. Because in reading Dr. Cole's material, in listening to uh, Preston Sprinkle and the Center for uh, Faith, Sexuality, and Gender, I think that's the terminology, that's where they start, is that homosexuality is a given state. It is not sin. It's not a disordered desire. Now, what confuses Christians is that they will say, but we do not believe that marriage can be between two men or two women. There is a um, gender binary that is fundamental to that definition. And they're right. Even though they will use terms like wife of two married women or husband of two married men. I don't see how that's consistent, but be that as it may. So they say, you know, and Dr. Cole says, so I'm committed to celibacy. I will not act on my desires. But at the same time, they will say, there is no such thing as an ex-gay. It is definitional of who you are. So that last paragraph, the idea that you should always come out and share with everyone your sinful desires happened because homosexual desire was transformed from sin which demands repentance, to a morally neutral category of personhood, LGBTQ+, which demands affirmation and celebration. There is the issue. How do you define what a human being is? And how do you, how do you and can you define what is a disordered desire? And so if you have... Constant disordered desire, is that sinful? And if you say no, then everything else, your message and everything else changes. And so, as always in these debates, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11, um, I will want to know, because there's some ambiguity in his published materials, whether Dr. Cole's where the things that he has said and what I've heard, there was a lecture that he did. Um, I guess it was a sermon uh, at a church fairly recently in California. Left me wondering exactly what he believes regarding arsenicoites and how clear our understanding of its meaning actually is. So there's going to have to be some discussion about what is found there. Because I don't believe there's any question 
that Paul includes in his list of sins, not only arsenokoites, but in the plural, arsenokoitai, but malakoi, ESV understands that as the act, active and passive partners in a male homosexual relationship. And then says, and such were some of you. Such were some of you. If it's an inalterable fact of reality, there could not be a were. There could not be a past tense. It would be such are some of you. But that's the exact opposite of what his point is. And the cleansing and the justifying and the sanctifying, that's the transition into where they are now, which is not where they were before. So five lies, Rosaria Butterfield, um, already enjoying it, not done with it yet, um, but already enjoying it and uh, will be helpful in um, what's coming up here fairly soon in um, in Pennsylvania. Please pray for that. Uh, please visit the travel fund at aomin.org. Uh, that's how we... I've, I don't know if you've been noticing. It's been interesting to me. I've never owned a diesel before in my life until last... Was it November I went and, and got doggy? I'm sorry? Was it October? Um, I'd never owned a diesel. And so, to be honest with you, you see those, you see the signs on the side of the road, but I just ignored the, you know, green number uh, because that's the diesel number. Uh, and when I got the truck, diesel was more expensive than unleaded. And then for a number of months, it's been less expensive than unleaded. Now, in a lot of places, unleaded and diesel are the same, about four forty nine dollars here in Phoenix. Uh, and, but in other places, it's gone above unleaded again. So the point is, we're going to have 5,100 miles to cover uh, next month. And um, when, the, when the fifth wheel is attached to the back, depending on weather, going east for the first few days, um, you have to climb a little bit the first day to get up to the Continental Divide. Then you get to go downhill all the way to the Mississippi. And you get about 10 miles to the gallon. Um, pulling a 10,000 pound uh, fifth wheel behind you. And then you start going up on the other side. But you normally have a tailwind as well when you're going east. Come back the other direction, 8.9 to 9 miles to the gallon, depending on, again, the weather, the wind, stuff like that. And uh, so, yeah, I got 32, a 32 gallon tank, so I can go you know, 300 miles or so before filling up. But uh, you got to pull into those uh, those diesel stations and... and um, ka-chung, 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 ka-chung. <laughs> that, I, I honestly had never in my life had a fill-up where it went to three digits. Uh, but that's pretty regular experience now. Uh, when, you've, when you've got a 32-gallon tank, you... Yeah, it takes a little money to fill it up. So the travel fund... Needs your assistance, your support. Um, obviously, we'll be doing the dividing line on the road uh, as we're going and uh, back into the into the studio. And again, I'm really interested. Should find out within the next couple of days. Um, I have a feeling we'll get the call, call here in the next couple of days to go pick up the unit. Haven't been in it since we dropped it off for the repairs that are being done, the temporary repairs that are being done. And um, it's been hot. So I'm really, really wondering what the background's gonna look like. And if it if it looks like it did before, we will need to do the dystopian dividing line. <laughs> I, I was gonna say we, we can't if it, it does that again, we can't miss that opportunity. Yeah. We'll yeah. we'll we'll uh we'll muddy you up a little bit, get you in there and doing the uh the dystopian dividing line. Rich wants to do it. We could do a lot we could have some fun with it. We really could. Um, we can come up with a whole scenario as to what happened, um, how the world ended, <laughs> who I'm running from, what do zombies look like, and, <laughs> and why can I still find diesel fuel? I don't know. <laughs> who knows? But um, 
that you can find some way of of explaining it, I suppose. But uh, anyhow, anyhow, that is uh, that is yet to come. So thanks for listening to the Vine Line today. Lord willing, we'll be back on uh, Thursday. We'll see you then. God bless. <laughs>